it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. In the aftermath of darkened deeds, among the shadows where sorrow feeds, there walks a figure silent, grim, to cleanse the stains where hope grows dim. With gloved hands and steady grace, they brave the scene, each haunting space, sweeping away the traces left behind, erasing the echoes of the troubled mind. Through shattered glass and blood-stained floor, they tread with purpose evermore, for in the aftermath of chaos's spree, they bring solace to those who long to be free. Their job is not for faint of heart, yet they play their part, a crucial part. For in the aftermath of crime's cruel reign, they offer solace and peace regain. The Job Offer by Darius McCorkindale and Caleb Sleeker The handwritten sign plastered to his door was not something he could miss. Ren, do on Monday. Don't be fucking late this time. Living with his best mate's sister had been working out reasonably well, and to be fair, he felt terrible about being behind on rent so often, but he still wished Hazel would find a less passive-aggressive way of reminding him. Yeah, if only his parents had bought him his own place after he graduated college, He'd get to be the one behaving like an overprivileged asshole, Mike reflected, before tearing the sign off the door and entering his bedroom. He flopped down onto his bed, exhausted after another morning of fruitless job searching. He knew he'd have to face facts. Things were getting tough, and he would simply have to accept anything that came along sooner rather than later. All he had to show for his efforts today was that interview at the fast food place scheduled for next week. As he got comfortable, he heard a crunching sound in his pocket and remembered the flyer that he'd been given earlier. He took it out and looked at it again. He'd been handed this piece of paper by some random guy as he was leaving the subway. He'd taken it more out of politeness than anything else, fully intending to throw it in the next garbage can he came across. Now, actually taking the time to read it, he was glad he hadn't done that. Well, there were scarcely any details, but it was enough information to pique his interest. Exciting job opportunity for the right candidate. Excellent pay. No experience required. Call this number. Well, I am at that point where I just need to do something to bring money in, so why the hell not? Hopefully this was said just loud enough for Hazel to overhear. Anyway, what harm could it do to give the number a call, he thought to himself. And so he dialed the number. The person on the other end picked up immediately. Good afternoon, Mr. Featherston. A female voice, not particularly unpleasant to the ear, but not hinting at any emotion either. Yes, um, hello. Wait a minute, how do you know my name? This is the Mr. Featherstone who received our contact details in the tube station earlier today, is it not? Yes, but... We're happy that you've chosen to get back to us so quickly, Mr. Featherstone. We would like to schedule an appointment to discuss this opportunity with you later this afternoon. The location is only about a ten minute walk from your apartment. Will 2.30 this afternoon be good for you? Hmm. How does she know where I live? He mused. This was all extremely weird, but those two words, excellent pay, were enough to motivate him. Uh, sure, uh, yes, yeah, that's fine. Good. Please come along to the following address at that time. Mr. Elliot is eager to meet you. Uh, what harm could it do to go along, he thought to himself. It was just around the corner, after all. What? The hell am I doing here? He thought, sitting in the lobby of an old but elegant office building which was indeed only a few minutes away from where he lived. The man at the front desk had ignored him, well, apart from pointing him in the direction of the bench he was now sitting on. The building was so nondescript that he could honestly say he'd never even acknowledged its existence, despite having walked past it hundreds of times in the last couple of years. 
However, he didn't have much time to ponder this, as he was soon greeted by the imposing figure of the gentleman who'd requested his presence. Ah, uh, Mr. Featherston, so nice of you to come at such short notice. Oh, um, call me Mike, please. No, I shall stick to Mr. Featherston. Mine is a business that requires formality. I'm sure you'll come to understand this soon enough. Well, this was not a man to be messed with. That much Mike could tell. Now, do follow me to my office. Again, this was non-negotiable. Mr. Elliot was already halfway there. Well, he broke into a light jog, not wanting to seem rude by lagging behind. Now, take a seat, Mr. Featherston. Oh, uh, thanks, Mike said withdrawing the copy of his resume from his bag in preparation for the coming interview. Um, perhaps I can give this... That won't be necessary, Mr. Featherston. We're already somewhat familiar with you as a candidate. We don't make offers such as this to random strangers. Well, okay then. Thank you for... Mike was once again cut off. This is not an interview in the conventional sense... I will explain our requirements. I will discuss the financial compensation. Then you should be given time to consider this information before coming to a decision. Mr. Elliot then looked directly into Mike's eyes, pausing his little speech. Um, okay, Mr. Elliot. Well, Mike was at a complete loss as to what to do or say at this point. Good. Now, here's my offer to you. Hazel, are you in there? Mike asked, knocking on her bedroom door. A few seconds later, she groggily opened the door. Mike, you know I work nights. Is it important? Damn, he'd forgotten about her shift work. Oh, sorry, Hazel. I just wanted to pay up what I owe you. Here you go. He handed over an envelope stashed with his, for once, not overdue rent. Bloody hell, Mike. In cash? I mean, did you rob a bank or something? He couldn't help but smile. Uh, no, not quite. Look, something's come up, and they paid me in advance for my first gig, so here you go. Um, I don't think I want to ask any more questions, do I? Um, maybe not. Well, Mike couldn't help but feel a little sheepish. Handing over a sizable wad of cash must have looked a little odd, he had to admit. Uh, don't worry, though, it is legit. Hazel gave a slight smile in response, the first time she'd done that to him in a long while. Oh, thanks, Mike. I want... Sorry about that note earlier. You know how I can get sometimes. <laughs> Think nothing of it. She widened her smile and then closed her door. Well, things were looking up already. All he had to do now was wait for the call. Two days, Elliot had said. Friday evening, just before midnight, at the address given. That all sounded simple enough. Mike would be working as a personal assistant to an exceptional client of Mr. Elliot's and would be there for a short period to help him out in whatever way was necessary. This would be a one-off occasion, after which he would not see that particular client again unless requested to do so. As a gesture of goodwill, Mike had been paid in advance for his first assignment. He hadn't been kidding when he said the pay was good, well, if this went well, Mike was at the very least out of financial trouble for a while. Of course, the goodwill gesture did come with a caveat. Even if Mike decided to quit after the first assignment, he'd have to go through with this one job, whatever it entailed. Now, time to wait and see what adventures Friday night would bring. Where was this place? It wasn't that the address had been hard to find. It was just that he couldn't imagine anyone wanting to be here, let alone some exclusive client of Mr. Elliot. This was smack in the middle of the city's most dilapidated industrial estate. He'd gotten an Uber to as close as possible, but even the driver wouldn't bring him all the way to the door. He had to walk the last half mile or so and was in real danger of being late. What was going on here? Mike approached the door, feeling more than mild trepidation. Before he had the chance to knock, the door was opened and a giant of a man stepped out to greet him. Uh, 
Uh, hi, I... Once again, Mike didn't get the chance to finish his sentence. First door on the left. Get changed and await instructions. Oh, be quick about it. The security guard then bundled him inside and slammed the door behind him. Mike found the room and entered. Oh, whatever he might have expected to see, it certainly wasn't this. A full hazmat suit. And this thing was the real deal, too. He was starting to get more of an idea as to why he'd been paid so handsomely. No job requiring him to wear this would be easy or pleasant. I'd uh, make sure you put that on properly, Mr. Featherston. Mike recognized that voice. He was starting to understand that it was also one he was never likely to forget. Mr. Elliot, what the hell's going on here? As I stated, a significant client of mine has need of your assistance. He can be found on the third floor. Your assignment is to merely perform what I like to refer to as post-task completion. What? Well, if his intention was to confuse Mike, it was certainly working. <laughs> Think of it this way. If someone were cooking a meal, the meal itself would be the uh, fulfillment of the task. Sitting down with a loved one, cutting into that steak, and enjoying a nice glass of red is what the whole experience is about. And of course, no one wants to think about washing the dishes afterwards. Nonetheless, the dishes need to be cleaned. That is what I mean by post-task completion. So, um, well, I'm here to clean up afterwards. Yes, Mr. Featherston, indeed you are. The creepiest smile Mike had ever seen slowly emerged in Elliot's expression. Now, as this is your first assignment, I'll be accompanying you to make sure it all goes smoothly. Mike had a feeling he wasn't going to be washing dirty dishes. He followed Elliot to the elevator. He pressed three, and they began their ascension. Mr. Elliot exited and made his way to a door some way down to the right. As previously, Mike found himself having to half-jog to catch up. He stopped at the door, turning to Mike with a look as cold as death on his face. Time to honour our agreement, Michael. There was something about Mr. Elliot's use of Mike's first name that utterly terrified him. He then proceeded to open the door. Hi, Mike. How was your first day? Hazel had an overly comfortable habit of walking around the apartment scantily dressed to the extent that Mike had, more often than not, mentally remind himself that this was his best mate's sister. Not tonight, though. His mind was elsewhere. Um, rough first shift. Don't really want to talk about it. Oh, sorry to hear that. I hope it gets easier from now on. Thanks. Um, actually... I think I might go to that interview on Monday. Might be good to weigh out my options. Uh, whatever works for you, Mike. She gave him a quick peck on the cheek. Just remember that rent's due again next month, yeah? He was scarcely listening, though. A rough first shift didn't do what he'd seen and done any kind of justice at all. He didn't know what he'd been expecting to see when Elliot opened that door. But it turned out to be a scene that was now burned into his psyche forever. This will be a uh, pretty tough clean-up, so take as much time as you need. Just make sure you do the job properly. And at that, Elliot had turned and left. Well, the room was poorly lit, so it was hard to make out what that coppery brown mess was that coated the walls. Well, he'd followed Elliot's advice and put the suit on properly, meaning he was also using its breathing apparatus. Had he not done so, he would have by now recognized the stench of fresh blood. His eyes met a figure, dressed in what appeared to be a full butcher's garb, slowly but precisely removing what were clearly the last few remaining chunks of flesh from the corpse in front of him. Its arms and legs were strewn across the floor. The head had been removed and tossed aside. The butcher turned to face Mike. I guess my accountant here has ripped me off for the last time, <laughs> he 
said with a sadistic chuckle. Only fair I got to rip him apart, don't you think? Yeah, indeed it is, my good friend. Mike twisted round to see Mr. Elliot had reappeared at the doorway. Oh, let me introduce you to my new junior associate, Mr. Featherston. He'll be performing clean-up duties this evening. Well, good luck with that, kid. The butcher then slowly exhaled stepped back from the remains of the corpse and started to make his way out of the room. I'll make sure you do the job right. I don't want a single trace of this piece of shit remaining when you're done. Well, that is our guarantee as always. Mr. Elliot then stepped aside to allow this murdering psychopath to exit the room, leaving Mike to survey the whole devastating scene. Make sure you get this place spotless. Take as much time as you need. Elliot said, now directly facing Mike. But I want this place so clean that you'd be able to eat your next meal off the floor in here. I'll be back in a couple of hours to see how you're getting on. He then pointed to a mop and bucket in the corner, as well as a bunch of cleaning supplies. He then ignited the incinerator, randomly picking up a limb and tossing it inside, before once again leaving the room. Okay then, Michael. Well, as I'm sure you can imagine, times are tough for all major multinational corporations, and the same goes for the fast food industry. Well, we'd love to have you on board, but we'd have to start you on a zero hours contract. Minimum wage to start, of course. Well, I'm pretty sure you'd be guaranteed at least eight to twelve hours of work every week, maybe even more. And after two or three years, you'll almost certainly be in line for a full-time position. So, what do you say? Are you excited to join the Bandit Burger team? Well, who wouldn't be? Was all that Mike could say in response. Great. Then we'll see you first thing tomorrow so you can pick up your new work clothes. Oh, sorry to say you'll be expected to buy them from the company, but, but you should earn enough in the first week or so to cover the costs. Mike offered the weakest of smiles in response. The following day, Mike... Resigned to his fate, knocked on the office door. Ah, there you are. So lovely to see you again. Mike had to chuckle at the absurdity of the situation. Yep, glad to be back. Raring to go, I assume. Mike hesitantly replied to this with a question. Um, can I be honest with you? Why, of course. I'm just really happy to have a job. Absolutely no harm in that at all. We're glad to have you on board and fully committed. So, Mr. Featherston, let's get you fitted up with a bespoke hazmat suit, shall we? The Job Offer Blood-Soaked Liar I sat and stared at my phone. An old, faded Nokia brick. The boss suggested it, sitting in the middle of my dirty coffee table. It sat still as ever, quiet and unmoving like it had been for the past three days. But I knew day three always brought new work. Yes, I could have called into work day after day, but I always got a one-off here and there. Mostly one day off, rarely two, but never more than three off days in a row, like it was an unofficial policy. And today was day three of me sitting on my ass waiting for the inevitable call. My first month of work had been a whirlwind of emotion. Mostly excitement, a lot of disgust, and a whole lot of what the fuckery. But I couldn't make up my mind if I hated it or loved it. That in itself should be a red flag for anyone getting to know me. The job was never the same, but it was mostly cleaning up desecrated and ripped up bodies. Or mostly human. Mostly. There were some other things mixed in with the gory crime scenes, like limbs, claws, and appendages that would be more at home in the Mariana Trench or the pervy anime. I considered where I'd come from, what I'd been through, and where I was now. Being with killers. Not being a killer, but being with them. It was a groove I always found myself setting smoothly into all my life. Was it a curse, or maybe more like birds of a feather? 
my waxing poetic about my past was put on hold when the old school Nokia let out its angry buzz vibrating across my glass tabletop. I picked it up quick, hearing my boss's dead tone call to me. It seemed my boss's voice was always even, but with a hint of cruelty lurking behind his words, or the feeling he was enjoying a secret joke at my expense. So glad to hear you pick up quickly. Show's initiative. I'm confident in saying you've shaken your initial, um, unsureties. Once again, he was right, and I felt like he was laughing at me for it. I had considered quitting multiple times during the first month. I figured on well, giving them a good three months, a quarter of a year, to make back their investment and time that they'd put into me. And if I was super respectful, my replacement wouldn't be scraping pieces of me into black plastic bags. As a dark thought occurs, maybe that was my first job, cleaning up the last guy to give three months. Hello, um... Is the phone we provided working correctly? Uh, y yes, Mr. Elliot, I quickly responded. I'm on board 100%. First, I thought I might not be a good fit for the team, but... Good, good, Mr. Elliot interrupted, rolling over my thoughts and concerns like a man stepping on an ant as he walks towards a goal. Well, no matter. No team today, just you. The request was for the highest discretion, so I needed my quickest and cleanest on the job. I kind of hated that I felt flattered. And no team. Nice. Those assholes were weird. I preferred to work alone and not have to watch my back the whole shift. Once again, Mr. Elliot read my mind and answered my next question preemptively. A triple the rate. A twelve-hour window can be lengthened if necessary. Let me know upon your personal evaluation of the job site. Endorphins dumped into my stream as I considered the high pay and the reason for it. I couldn't help my dark curiosity from getting the better of me. I kind of wanted to see this. I wanted to see the carnage. Fifteen minutes later, a black Mercedes came to pick me up, and off I went to the mysterious job site. The driver told me a dumpster had been placed on site and would be absconded away when the job was finished. Yes, now I was very interested in what awaited me at the job site. As I sat in the back of the pristine Mercedes, I had no cell phone service and no one to talk to. The driver had retreated back behind his roll-up window. I also realised the windows were tinted black on the inside to keep me from seeing where I was being taken. I guess it was better than a bag thrown over my head by some goon on Mr. Featherston's payroll. Forty minutes later, the vehicle came to a stop and the automatic doors unlocked. I sat still for a while, waiting on the driver to open the door for me, but no dice. I had to open my own damn door. I stepped out into the crisp evening air. The sun was going down and the soothing sound of wind blowing through the trees surrounded me. I was in some forest clearing by the side of a gravel road. The Mercedes wasted no time in almost hitting me with the side mirror as it backed up and zoomed away. I turned to see what he was so adamant on getting away from. In front of me, thirty meters out, up on a hill, was a giant three-story mansion dominating the skyline. It towered over the trees that packed tightly against it as it stood elevated up the hill. It was old, but beautiful in a haunted Downton Abbey sort of way. I cursed the asshole driver as I began my hike up the hill. Well, true to their word, my employees had provided a blue metal dumpster outside the building, with a pallet of cleaning product neatly packed together. How did they get all this here so quickly in these deep woods? How did they drop this shit off with a helicopter? I walked up the creaky steps to the front door. I half expected the door to open on its own, like the cliché in every haunted house story. It didn't open on its own, but was already cracked ajar. The door handle smashed inwards, along with bits of the door frame splintered. I exhaled slowly as I pushed the door open with my foot, ready for anything to rush at me from inside the mansion. But halfway open, and nothing moved inside the quiet house. 
I push the door a little further to let the surviving sunlight shine into the entryway. The door stuck on something I wouldn't give. I look down to see my first client, a man crumpled up on the ground, a knife jammed up under his chin. A thick pool of blood saturated this dead man. His eyes rolled back in his head and his brow furrowed in a perpetual scowl. His mouth pinned shut by the knife, but still oozing blood and spit from between closed lips. Of course, the house was dark, and there was no light switch by the door. I could see the warm glow of light in a room to my right, but it wasn't enough to illuminate anything else. I thought of using the flashlight app on my phone, but quickly remembered I didn't have a modern phone. No, I had the prehistoric Nokia. I looked back at the pallet of cleaning supplies and, thank God, there were flashlights and glow sticks. One was a standard heavy-duty mag light, a super bright LED light made to look and carry like an old lantern, and lastly the one with an elastic strap to fit across my head like a coal miner. I set up quickly, head strapped, mop and bag of supplies in one hand and heavy mag light in the other. I appreciated the heaviness of the big light. It could easily be used to crack somebody across the dome in a pinch. I put on a fresh face mask, took a deep breath, and pushed into the dark house. I cracked and dropped a green glow stick by Mr. Knife Gin at the door. And immediately I was thrown off by the layout of the house. The front door opened up to a long hallway that ran straight across the house and into the shadows of the other end of the structure. Doorways lined each side of the hallway but they were spaced irregularly. Five doorways on the left and three on my right. The first doorway on the right next to me was flush against the wall of the front of the house, and the last two were very close together all the way at the other end. The doorways on the left seemed a little better. All five were spaced out pretty evenly except for doorway two and three, which were only six inches away from each other. And who builds a house like this? Some sort of idiot or artist, that's who I suspected. It was like a child's attempt at a house, or a house from a bad dream. The layout made no sense at all. As any sane person would expect, I expected the number of doorways to annotate the number of rooms running off the main hallway. Five rooms on the left and three on the right, yeah? Well, that turned out to be a lie. There was one main hallway, a giant ass room on the left, and a giant ass room on the right. All the doorways led into the same huge rooms on either side. But I'd have to worry about the strange building layout later. Now I had to go body hunting. On my first initial peeks into both rooms, I caught the sights of bodies in both. I took the left room first. The closest two bodies were laying right next to each other. A black male with blood all over his mouth with multiple gunshots in his chest. His hands were frozen in awkward, curled fists, indications of a very painful death. The man next to him was wearing a ski mask and camo. His throat ripped out, blood all over his face and torso that had also pooled under the two of them. A gun in his hand, slide rocked back to show it was empty. It didn't take a genius or a CSI specialist to figure out what had happened. Black dude tackled camo man, Camo Man emptied the clip into the black guy's belly before the black guy ripped Camo Guy's throat out with his teeth and rolled off him to die. That's pretty hardcore. Further down the long room was a few chairs randomly placed and an old hairy 70s looking throw rug smushed up against the wall. I found my next body at the far end, half of the top of his head missing and propped against the far wall. He was a pale white man with loose fitting clothes. Some sort of petticoat and yellow shorts. A top hat lay bloody in his lap. And come to think of it, the dead dude at the door and the black guy also had weird clothes on. Going back to check, I noted that the black man was shirtless, barefoot with blue jeans, a belt around his waist that didn't go through the loops, and a gold watch on either hand. The guy with a knife in his neck was the closest to being normal, except he was wearing heavy winter clothes like a big puffy jacket, a beanie and gloves, with no shirt underneath and unzipped. Was this some crazy cult that had decided to dress like idiots? Why had they been attacked by camo dude? 
Maybe the mystery would be revealed when I explored the right side room. And oh boy, did the right side room have answers, but raise more questions too. There was a dinner table in the middle of the room, bodies all around it. On the table was a woman, red-haired, young. She had bound hands and feet with rope and a knife sticking out of the center of her chest, just like Dexter would do in the TV show. Her eyes opened and her mouth wide in a forever scream. I felt a twinge of sadness for her. I was usually good about keeping my emotions in check around the dead, but this girl felt different from the rest of the jokers laying dead in this house. She seemed like an innocent, like a victim. She was wearing the torn rags of clothes that had been ripped off of her. Her shirt hung stretched and torn around her neck, exposing her stomach and bra. Her pants legs had been ripped long ways to reveal her calves. I leaned in closer, and to my horror, I saw that pieces of her legs had been ripped off, like something was eating her. This was a new sort of messed up for me. These guys were cannibals. Looking at the dead around the table, I counted two bodies with weird clothes and blood around their mouths and hands. They'd both been shot with what looked like a shotgun, judging by the pellet spread on both of them. I turned around to find the culprit that had killed them. He was another camera-wearing guy, crumpled by the doorway leading out to the hallway. The shotgun was broken in half, and the guy's left arm was just gone. The wall had been dented inwards from where he'd been thrown into it. His blood splattered all over the doorframe and the ground. I counted three ejected shotgun shells near him, but only two dead. I'd searched for a third body, but never found one. Neither did I find the missing arm. Oh, no matter. My junior matlock time was over. Now I had a job to do. There was cleaning to get done. I began the arduous task of cleaning up evidence, wrapping up bodies in tarps and hauling them to the dumpster. I doubled up on masks after mopping, to spray bleach everywhere. It wasn't until I was outside bringing out the last body. It was the redhead. I'd saved her for last and treated her the most gentle as I stacked her on the pile of burrito wrap bodies. That, well, that's when I looked up and remembered the house was three stories. Oh shit, I had two other floors to look into. I hadn't seen the stairs or anything in the house to remind me, and I'd been so disturbed by the weirdness of this job that I tunnel-visioned onto my work. How could I forget something so obvious? I was supposed to be good at my job. I turned on my headlamp and maglite and cursed as I stomped back towards the house. I had to make sure if there was a way up to the second and third floor. Hopefully there were no bodies and I could end this job. But little did I know that the upper floors held something I'd never come across in my short career. I found a survivor. Oh God, two floors left. How could I forget about them? I mean, I staged all the bodies at the door until I was done cleaning and then dragged them out into the yard to the dumpster. And it was pitch black outside already. No moon to be seen. I knew I was just making excuses for being distracted and losing my focus. Well, the fact was, I had to clean the whole house. And so it's good I caught my F up before I called somebody to come get me. I stomped around the dark building, searching the ceiling for any signs of egress. My head-mounted flashlight, though dimmer than before, was still working. And the many green glow sticks spread about the floor gave off a haunted house or sci-fi vibe. At least the strange layout of the building made it easy to search. Only two rooms and a hallway running down the middle. I cleared the left room and the hallway when I finally found what I was looking for. At the very back of the right room was what appeared to be a circular hole, just wide enough for me to squeeze through if I sucked in. But first I had to get up to it. I pulled over the giant table the poor redhead girl had been killed on and stacked a chair on top of it. Slowly, on shaken footing, I stood atop the chair and ascended towards the hole in the ceiling. I turned my mag light on and laid it by the lip of the hole as my head and torso made it through the opening. 
My head mounted light showing me nothing but old boxes and the fog of floating dust. Well, I could pull myself the rest of the way up easily from where I was. I grabbed the ledge of the opening and immediately touched something warm and wet. I looked at my hands to see what I already fully suspected. It was fresh blood, but not a lot of it. I could see the spattering trail of it running around the boxes, some having been knocked over. Well, shit. I hoped whoever the blood belonged to was already dead and not some half-crazed, badly-dressed cannibal waiting for me. Brief struggle and I heaved myself from floor one to floor two. I picked up my mag light, holding it cocked back ready to strike, and was glad for my corona mask helping me block out most of the dust. From what I could see, the second floor was just one large room, like a loft. The high ceiling revealed that there was never a third floor to begin with. The boxes were tightly packed together, filled with old clothes and assorted garbage you might find at your local thrift store. The wall at the front of the house had four windows. Two windows four feet up and another two windows four feet above them, giving the impression of three floors from the outside of the building. No moonlight in through the windows though, leaving my visibility low and claustrophobic. It was like the house was built to look normal from the outside, but whoever built it dropped the facade when designing the inside. I slowly followed the blood trail, scooting boxes out of my way as I did. It seemed there was a lot more blood at the beginning of the trail, and less and less as I followed it. My amateur CSI skills had no idea what that meant. I turned a corner and almost jumped out of my skin as my light illuminated a pale face peering at me from behind two boxes. Fright gripped my body as I realized whoever I was tracking was alive. My brain finally kicked in and I recognized it was the face of a child, an extremely scared child. Her brown eyes stared at me as I stared right back in silence. Both of us were frozen like deer in headlights, studying each other's expressions. She was young, a teenager maybe, with pale skin, freckles like a band-aid across her nose and cheeks, and reddish open hair. She reminded me of the dead girl on the table. Hell, she could even have been the dead girl's kid sister. I recognized the look of fear on her face and realized I was the scary one in this situation. This girl was probably hiding from whatever hell happened downstairs, and then my ass comes stomping around in the dark, following her blood trail and shining a blinding light in her eyes. I pulled down my mask and put on the best comforting smile I could muster. I reached up slowly to click off my headlamp and pointed the mag light at the ground between us so she could see my face. Hi, um, yeah, uh, I'm not with them. I pointed down at the ground awkwardly and tried to smile harder. Um, well, I mean, I don't know anything about what happened down there, and I don't care either. I'm just here to clean up the mess and bounce. I'm just looking for bodies, not alive people. She stared at me, unblinking. I'm not going to hurt you, that's what I mean. I spat out, realizing I was doing a terrible job at not sounding creepy. She did blink at this, and I saw her expression soften. But then she winced in pain and stumbled forward, knocking one of the boxes over. Oh, shit, are you okay? I asked as I finally caught a good look at her without the boxes blocking her. I saw her holding a towel tightly to her side, soaking up dark blood. Oh, she's not okay. Shit, shit. What should I do? Do I help her? Do I call the boss? I mean, I mean, I don't deal with the living, but shit, she's just a kid. Can't let her bleed out. What if I call this in and they want me to snuff her? Or send some goon to come do it instead of me? I don't want to be responsible for killing a kid, but if I do nothing, she'll probably die of blood loss. How much blood do you need to lose before you pass out? Well, my mind raced through millions of inner thoughts and dialogue. My brain was shooting questions and scenarios back and forth through itself like a lively debate. I'm not good with people or situations like this. It's why I prefer the dead. I decided to start small. How'd you get here? I asked. I lowered myself down to one knee to appear less threatening like the cops always do with kids on TV. 
With my sister, she said slowly in an accent I'd never heard before. Maybe English wasn't her first language. A sudden realization hit me, and I felt sadness like I'd never felt before on a job. It was her sister that was tied, stabbed, and chewed on downstairs. Well, the bodies I would come across never felt this personal. I could always disconnect from what had happened to them. This was the first time it had a personal context to a victim. Were you taken here by the bad people downstairs? I asked. No, she said, nodding her head up and down, sending me some mixed signals. Maybe it was from the shock or just different customs from wherever she was from. No, the men came and killed my friends. Sister pushed me up here to hide. Is she still down there? Uh, yes, and I mean, no, I stuttered, thoroughly confused by what she'd told me. Was this girl friends with the really badly dressed cannibals? Or were the camera guys the actual cannibals? So the camera guys busted into this house and killed everybody and ate on the legs of her sister. Yeah, but the camo guys didn't have blood around their mouths. Maybe they were bloody under the masks. The forensics told a very different story, but like I've said, I'm no expert. The girl winced in pain and swayed like she was about to pass out. She gripped the bundled clothes tighter to her side, blood running down her pants now. How bad are you hurt? I asked with genuine concern. One of the men fired a gun that shot little bullets everywhere. Some of the tiny bullets hit my side before I got up here. It's not bad, though. I think it's getting better. <sighs> getting better? I scoffed. You don't just get better from gunshot wounds. Please let me see your injury. I swear I'm not here to hurt you. The girl scowled at me and ducked down defensively as I reached out. I knew I'd overstepped my bounds and felt like she would snap off one of my fingers like a stray dog if I pushed further. I then jumped out of my skin at the sound of a tremendous bang from downstairs, followed by the sound of heavy footsteps. Cleaner, are you in here? came a man's bellowing voice. The girl ran back behind another set of stacked boxes. Don't let him get me, she whispered harshly. He was one of the men who hurt me. Whoa, whoa, I said, patting the air. My job is to clean, not to be a narc. I could see she didn't get what I was saying, so I reiterated. I won't tell him shit. She smiled slightly at this, but it whipped off her face when another angry yell from downstairs echoed up to us. If you're in here, show yourself. I might have to burn this damn house down. I wouldn't want to kill one of Mr. Elliot's employees. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, uh, I'm coming down now, I yelled back. Before I turned back towards the hole, I thought of something. I spun back to face the girl and rolled the mag light to her. That's company property, so I'll need it back, I joked with what I hoped was a calming demeanor. When I was standing over the hole, I could see the moving shadow of someone pacing back and forth, waiting on me in the glow of green light. I lowered myself back down to the unsteady chair on the table, and then down to solid ground. My name is Sir Thaddeus Freeman, said a broad-shouldered man, carrying a long silver knife in his left hand. He had a meticulously groomed salt and pepper goatee, balding with silver hair around his ears. His face was withered and wrinkled like old leather, but his eyes held an ice-blue clarity. I'm afraid that I have called upon your services too soon, he continued. It was the fault of one of my protégés. It's not common for us hunters to leave a job unfinished. So he is the client. This Sean Connery-looking dude called me in to clean up his mess. As I stared at him, I noticed his strange attire. Black vest over a white collared shirt. Baggy black BDU pants with a big revolver on his left hip. I realized that his black vest was wet, with red blood staining his white undershirt. Oh, uh, good to meet you, Mr. Freeman. Sir Freeman, he corrected sharply. Oh, my apologies, Sir Freeman. I usually never meet the clients of the job. 
Is there anything I can help you with? I bullshitted, hoping my forced politeness was convincing. Yes, I do, he interjected sternly. Have you seen anyone else around the property? A young girl, perhaps? Oh, yeah, I have, I responded cheerfully. I turned to point at the table. Yeah, there was a dead red-haired girl on the table when I arrived. She's on top of the pile if you... No, a living girl. She'll be very similar in appearance to the poor lass on the table. This she-beast is a smart one. She takes the appearance close to what the intended prey looks like, he said. Then he looked down and began talking in a way that sounded like he was mostly talking to himself. She must be old enough to discern how humans think on a basic level. She's picked up on little things, like looking similar to the targeted human, or so the monster can get close, so the human lets their guard down. Well, all I've seen are the recently deceased that were spread all over the building, I said. Sir Freeman looked back at me with a doubting expression, so I tried to change the subject. Oh, you're bleeding, I pointed at his blood-stained shirt and vest. Do you need help? I think I have bandages outside with the supplies. Look here, boy, the man said, stepping forward with a wince of pain and sticking his finger hard into my chest. This thing is not human. The bitch is a liar. Her and her pack have been killing unsuspecting humans like that poor young redhead for centuries. They stalk and study their prey for months. They take the form of a human for one night a year to feed on man's flesh and lengthen their horrid lifespans. I stepped back from the man's angry tirade when spittle from his mouth sprinkled my face mask. I don't believe it was on purpose, so I didn't deck the old timer immediately, but I sure as hell wasn't going to remain in spitting distance of him. Besides, he had a knife, a gun, and he was a client. Okay, okay, I understand, I said patting the air in a calming gesture for a second time during the night. I'll keep an eye out, but I'm almost through here anyway, Miss oh, Sir Freeman. Don't lie to me, boy. I tell you monsters exist, and you blew it off like I'm some crazy old-timer. You don't even believe me, do you? He finished, his sharp blue eyes cutting into me. I've seen some weird stuff since starting this job, so maybe monsters are real. What matters is you believe it's real and you're the paying client, I responded, feeling good about fooling the crazy old-timer. <laughs> of course he was crazy. Worst part about this old man's story was he wasn't even getting his monsters right. I guess he was trying to describe werewolves, but werewolves turn into wolves on full moons, not from monsters into humans. And there was no moon outside tonight anyway. I didn't know what was going on, but I'd done my good Christian deed already. I gave the kid upstairs a flashlight and lied for her. Now I needed to get the hell away from this guy. They have to eat on this night or they die. Their life force leaves them, Sir Freeman told me with bug eyes. My hunters and I stopped them before they could consume the girl. And you placed all the bodies outside. But she's still around. Daybreak is within an hour. She will be coming back. Come, unfortunately... I have another job to get to, so... I lied politely as I backed away from him. I'll give you $500 to wait with me for another hour. You just have to watch the bodies until they're picked up. I'll lay in wait inside if she shows herself. Will you take this deal? Y yeah, yes, um, Sir Freeman. I can push back my other job a little, I quickly answered. This guy was obviously crazy, but... I'm not crazy enough to turn down that type of cash. Good. Just stay out front. You might see Squire Jacob traipsing around in the woods. Don't mind him. Squire? What the hell? These guys are cosplaying King Arthur in the supernatural. I was about to turn around and head outside when he asked one more question. Did you check the top floors completely? Uh, yes, I said turning back to face him with my fake, pleasant voice. There's only one more floor, actually. Well, this house has some crazy architecture. I watched the man turn and limp towards the table, looking up at the hole in the ceiling. It's a farce, just like them. He turned his head to eyeball me, just like the creatures themselves. 
normal looking on the outside, but corrupted and hollow on the inside. How they lured that poor girl in here. If only we weren't too late to save her. Okay, um, well, I'm going to stand outside now, I said as I once again tried to break away from the conversation. Wait, the old man said alarmingly. He jumped up on the table with uncanny dexterity and reached up to touch the edge of the hole. Fresh blood, he stated as he dipped his fingers in the blood from the girl upstairs. Oh, that. I scrambled in my brain for something. I looked down at the girl's fresh blood on my hands. Yeah, I cut my hand on something while climbing. I finished, feeling proud of myself as I quickly flashed the palm of my hand to the man. Well, that was a mistake. The squirrely old goat must have eyes like a hawk because he immediately jumped down from the table and rushed me. He snatched my hand and flipped my palm around to inspect. Bullshit, he growled. No cut. Not your blood. Mr. Fr I mean, sir. The old timer interrupted by delivering a devastating punch to my stomach, knocking the wind out of me and collapsing me to the ground. He then turned to race up the table and chair, silver knife in one hand, gun in the other. He disappeared up through the hole as I sucked in air and tried to stand. I could hear his thundering footsteps as the ceiling cracked and bulged above me. Oh, there you are, you she-bitch, I heard him yell, followed by one loud gunshot. The girl screams, and there was stomping about like a fight was happening. She continued to scream as the tumultuous footsteps travelled around above me. But then he began to scream, and I heard the distinct sound of metal hitting something hard. The floor busted out above me, and two legs fell through. I rolled out of the way as the immense sound of further cracking followed. No, you're not getting away again, Sir Freeman screamed right before the bottom fell out on the second floor, and two figures fell together to glide into the ground in a cloud of dust and wood fragments. I could barely tell what was happening, with only the green glow of the sticks illuminating all the upturned dust. The dust started to clear, and I could see Sir Freeman on his back with the poor girl in a bear hug. She screamed in pain and scratched at his face weakly. She turned her head to spot me, her eyes wide and mouth open in a desperate plea. Help! Sir Freeman grunted and hugged her tighter, causing her to let out her air in a disgusting croak. He rolled them over so he ended up on top of her, pinning her to the ground with his hand around her neck. I should have known a gunshot wouldn't take you down. Oh, I have to use silver on the Alpha, he yelled into her face as he put the tip of the silver knife right to her solar plex. Just like the other redhead had been killed just like her sister. That's all the evidence I needed to keep a crazy old man from gutting a defenseless girl in front of me. I ran up behind him and snatched his revolver from its loose fisting holster and jammed the barrel end into the nape of his neck. Get off the girl, psycho! I demanded, my voice shaking with fear and rage. Oh, stupid boy, she isn't human. She's almost out of time before she changes back. I have to kill her while she's in his weakened state, Sir Freeman yelled back at me without turning. I'd figured he was going to argue with me or test my mettle, so I whacked him pretty good across the side of his head with the long barrel of the gun. To the old bastard's credit, he barely flinched as blood began pouring down his face. I bet no one else knows you're here, right? I'll just wrap you up with the rest of your sicko dead friends outside, I screamed, hoping he'd take the blood. I didn't know if I could kill a dude execution style. Okay. Okay, Sir Freeman said. He slowly moved the knife away from the girl's belly and held it out to the side, placing it on the ground out of the girl's reach. He shifted his weight to pin the girl down by straddling her and held both hands up. God, he was making me sick. You're a businessman, right? He said in a much calmer tone. I know this is a lot to take in, but in a short while, the creature's bodies outside will revert to their animal form, and I will be justified. But I have to kill her before she returns to normal. I'll pay you an additional $20,000 to stand down. I swear, I'm the good guy here. 
before I could reject his offer. The girl lunged up swiftly to chomp her teeth right on his nose. And of course he screamed and pushed her back down with all his force. He pulled away from her and held the place where his nose used to be. I jumped back, screaming along with this noseless man, but without a wasted moment the girl reached out for the knife on the floor beside her. He was distracted enough for her to pull away and snatch the knife, quickly whipping it back between them and thrusting the entire blade up into Sir Freeman's throat and up into his skull. A fountain of blood erupted out of the stab wound when she pulled the blade out. Sir Freeman's hands dropped and he began to topple, but the girl had scrambled out from under him and caught him. She opened her mouth and put it to the bloody geezer of the wound. She hugged him tight as she sucked on the blood like a greedy leech. What the f- what the fuck? I stammered as I backed away from this horrible scene. The girl was now hungry, biting off chunks of flesh from the dead man's neck, swallowing and eating, swallowing and eating eating. At first, I thought it was my inner monologue screaming in my head when I heard the voice behind me. Oh God, no. It can't be. Sir Freeman. I turned to see some white guy with a high and tight haircut, wearing all camo and black face paint under his eyes. He charged at me, and I realized this must be the squire Sir Freeman had mentioned earlier. I also realized, too late, that I appeared rather sus, spinning around with a gun in my hand. The squire leveled a yellow gun at me, and with a pop, I felt the power of a city's electrical grid flow through me. All my muscles tensed up, and I toppled over to smack my head on the ground. The asshole that had tasered me discarded the weapon and ran past me. It felt like an eternity, but the taser ran its cycle and finally released me from its hellish grasp. I shakily pulled the probes out of my chest and rolled over to see what was happening. The girl must have retreated into the hallway through one of the awkwardly placed doors because Squire Boy was bending down over his dead companion. I'll finish it, Master. I'll finish the hunt, he said melodramatically before darting off into the hallway, the silver knife in his hand. I lay there, wondering what I should do. I thought of bouncing while the guy was distracted. I didn't have to defend the tiny cannibal girl any longer. She could handle herself. But would I get fired for not cleaning up the extra dead body? Was it like abandoning her job site? I was actually more afraid of getting on Mr. Elliot's bad side. A shriek, similar to a woman but incredibly primal and loud, pierced through the house. I heard the man scream in panic. <clears throat> oh God, no. I had more time. I had more time. Squire came running back into the room and looked at me, terrified. His right hand was torn to ribbons and bleeding. The silver knife was nowhere to be seen. He was jumping up and down like a scared kid as he pointed at the gun in my hand. Oh, you have to help me. Shoot it or it will kill both of us. A giant ball of fur and muscle flew into the room and smashed into the man. It was a freaking cat, a big one with pointed ears and a long tan body. It was a mountain lion. The beast's mouth engulfed the man's face and bit down, shaking him about like a chew toy as the giant animal stood over him. I watched the screaming man be shook violently, blood running from his face to be smeared like a paintbrush on the ground, until his neck cracked and he whimpered to silence. I thought about how this was a very ineffective way to kill someone. It's almost like the big cat chose to cause as much pain as possible before the man died. When it finally turned its giant bloody face to look at me, I realized how stupid I'd been for not running. I was too entranced or in shock with the brutality in front of me, and now I had no chance of outrunning this thing. It began stalking towards me on its padded feet. I wasn't going to go down without a fight, so I scrambled to my feet and raised my gun. Oh, the damn cat was so fast, clearing the gap between us in a microsecond and slapping the gun out of my hand to sling it against the wall. I cried out and half expected to see my hand in tatters, like the squire's had been, but it was still intact, just throbbing from the force of the hit. The beast, now only a foot from me, let out a low growl and sat on its hind legs. He got up, 
let out that awful woman-like scream and sat down again quickly, only to do the stand-up, sit-down motion again. Oh, I'm not stupid. I promptly sat down on my ass, now face level with the killer animal. Its feline eyes studied me, and its hot rancid breath invaded my nostrils through my mask. The cat, satisfied somehow, turned away from me and looked up into the big hole that had just been created in the ceiling. With feline grace, it launched itself up silently into the darkness of the second floor. I waited, wondering if I should try to run now. That thing was so fast, though. Was it just playing with me like a house cat plays with a caught mouse? After a few moments, the cat returned, plopping down gracefully in front of me, a black maglite in its bloody mouth. Oh, no way, I said with incredulity, as the beast walked up to me and dropped the light. It stared at me a moment longer before promptly turning around to sprint out of the room in a flash. I heard the front door get bashed open as it left the house. Well, I just sat there, dumbstruck. After a good ten minutes of sitting and digesting what had happened, I was fairly confident the little girl monster wasn't coming back for me. I walked out the front door into the bright rays of a dawning sun to burn my sensitive eyes. I took the phone out of my pocket and speed dialed number one. Mr. Elliot answered after two rings. Is it done? The boss's voice cut right to the chase. You were supposed to call me when you arrived. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Elliot. It won't happen again. It's been a hell of a night. Unforeseen variables got in the way of me finishing on schedule, I explained. There was a pause on the other end before the boss answered. Do you need more time? was all he asked. Um, yes, Mr. Elliot. And... Maybe one more thing. Hmm. What's that? We need to discuss hazard pay. So there is actually um, quite an interesting story behind tonight's video. Now there's a couple of tales, probably about three-ish years old now, which I'd never put together as a compilation. I think it is deserving of it, and um, you know, I should tell you the story behind it. So, um, I did get this idea that I could also be a bit of a writer of horror stories from a while back there, and I've dabbled with it on and off uh, in the following years, but I just don't have enough time to devote to it as much as I would like. Anyway, the first one, the job offer, that was the first ever story I wrote, and I must be honest, I'm, I'm quite proud of it. Um, not because I think it's the greatest horror story ever, but because it achieved what I wanted it to achieve. Um, there was some. Um, bit of social commentary on the state of the job market as it is in a lot of the world today. Um, rather do a job for cleaning up, you know, slaughtered bodies than working in a fast food restaurant. Um, that's the state of things. And um, also, you know, it's uh, a bit of a suspension of uh, disbelief as well. And, you know, you didn't quite know what was happening at the end, I hope. And then um, I was saying, well, you know, I don't want to continue with this. This is enough as a standalone 20 minute story. But um, Caleb Slieger, the author of um, Reverse Vampires and many of the other great stories on this channel, said, um, do you mind if I continue? I was like, well, why not? OK, I don't expect anything from it. Just, you know, take the story. You've got the main characters. Go however which way you want with it. And he did. So um, that's the second part. And I feel that there's um, a whole lot more story there to be had. But um, not quite sure what I'd do with it. But if anybody else is um, willing to take this on and write a third part, go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, I'm waffling on here. That is enough for this evening. Till uh, the next time, my dear friends, uh, waiting to hear from you about this anyway. Um, let me know what you think. Till the next time. Very, very sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. Really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.